first of all, I would like to say it is a great opportunity for me to come out of my lab and office and speaking to different group, which I normally don't speak to, because most of the time I speak to my peer group, who is also the scientist in the field. So it's much easier, so I don't have to really explain every terminology. But here, I take it is a great opportunity for me to communicate with you about what we are doing using plant language. Maybe um, this is going to be a very interesting experience. So stop me if you have any question, you are not, you know, if you have any concern or any question about what I'm saying, I'll be happy to explain it to you before I move back. All right, so about myself, like what I say, I came here for graduate school, starting my graduate school in Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson University. That is where I finished my PhD. Then I moved to National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland to um, complete my PhD postdoc training before I moved to uh, medicine in 2008, starting my assistant professor faculty position. So I have been here, let me see, almost 14 years, right? Close to 15 years. I heard some of you came to medicine in 1970s. 1970 is the years I was born. So, oh, so oh. That, that is a very interesting experience, right? So um, anyway, so I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk to longtime resident, uh, medicine resident uh, about my research. All right, so uh, I am associate professor and also principal investigators of muscular skeletal biology and regenerative medicine laboratory. I'll tell you what is this lab and how we're doing research in my lab. Um, I am not MD, so I am a PhD doing medical research in the clinical department. So, so I, I probably won't provide too much information about how how to treat your, if you have any joint concern or joint problem. But I do have the opportunity today to tell you what I think you can possibly get in the future with the research currently I'm doing in my laboratory, which is focused on stem cell therapy. So my research will focus primarily on the pri uh, stem cell therapy for osteoarthritis treatment. Let me see how can I move this forward. Last page. Oh yes. So again, my lab doing research, trying to develop stem cell based therapy as regenerative treatments for cartilage repair. That's the goal. So we study different type of stem cells. So we focus on how to regenerate articular cartilage, which is the surface, which is the tissue on your joint surface. We also try to develop approach to generate good quality stem cell for treatment. And during this process, we also try to understand why our stem cell get older. That's the three area of research I'm currently focused on. So I would like to ask you, how many of you have seen ad <laughs> like this? Almost every one of you, right? So this is interesting because sometimes you see the ad on TV, it will tell you, hey, now you can get stem cell injection that can magically cure your joint diseases or joint pain. Or you can see a magazine in the airline C back pocket. You can open it, you'll see, well, such and such clinic provides this type of a therapy that can really magically help you to heal your joint. Is that really true? What is the challenge 
That is the topic of my talk today. I hope before you leave today, you have some understanding about this kind of stem cell clinic, whether it is real or not real for providing so-called effective stem cell treatment. All right, so what I'm going to cover today, basically, I would like to tell you about osteoarthritis, right? So first I would like to tell you what is the problem of the osteoarthritis or what is the current issue, or you can expect in what you see when someone has osteoarthritis. And uh, what is the current treatment for osteoarthritis? and the challenges that is associated with the current treatment. And of course, I will cover a lot about how the stem cell can possibly provide the potential treatment to cure joint diseases such as osteoarthritis. And then of course, I will say, what is the new finding that is found in my research lab? So that's something I'm going to cover today. All right, so you all know osteoarthritis is a disease widespread almost in the population, not only in the United States, also in the world. Almost there statistically says it's about one out of six people who suffer some sort of arthritis. So what is arthritis? Simply saying, arthritis is described as inflammation and stiffness of a joint. So that's a very simple definition. So when your joint suffer from stiffness and inflammation, you can say you probably have arthritis, but there are many, many kinds of arthritis. That's probably more than 100 different kinds of osteoarthritis. The most common one are two. One is called osteoarthritis. The other one is rheumatoid arthritis. These two are the one most of people suffer from. They have different causes to this two type of arthritis. One is generally caused by aging, mechanical loading, or other factors such as genetics. And uh, rheumatoid arthritis is generally caused by autoimmune diseases. So this too, what I'm going to cover primarily is osteoarthritis because that's most popular, or I would say is most the disease that affecting most of the people. So, Arthritis, by definition, again, like what I said, is inflammation of the joint. So previously, people thought osteoarthritis is only attacked cartilage tissue, which is the tissue on the surface of the joint. Now, there are more and more evidence showing arthritis is a whole joint disease not just a disease attacking cartilage. So when someone suffers from osteoarthritis, their cartilage is degenerated and also soft tissue, such as synovium, ligament, tendon, they are all affected certain degree by the disease and even underneath of the cartilage, there is a subchondral bone. It will undergo sclerosis. It becomes stiffer. So the whole entire area, basically inside of the joint, get inflammated. They have all kinds of uh, activity going on. So that leads to degradation of the tissue. That's the new idea. And uh, I would like to make sure you know Osteoarthritis is a whole joint disease. One of the symptoms is cartilage degeneration, all right? So if you get that, how can we try to treat patients? 
So you are probably aware of people maybe around you or your friends have received a so-called total joint replacement, right? So this total joint can be hip or knee replacement. This is a graph that's showing how total joint replacement is done. In general, they use metal and plastic processes to replace damage cartilage or joint surface. So this is a very, I would say, brutal procedure. But basically, they will have to cut a significant portion of your joint tissue, whether it is affected or not affected, then allow the space to put in metal and plastic. So you can see this procedure is very unnatural. Even it promised with almost 80 to 90% of a successful rate after 10, 20 years after operation, it still has the significant challenge. The major challenge is this following. Number one, these procedures are not suitable for young patients. If you just started receiving this procedure at age 40, 50, they are 30 years or 40 years before the end of the life, you probably have to go back to a hospital several times to actually get those replacement. And then also the procedures normally is safe, but there's always a chance associated with the infection as well as blood clots. And as well as depends on the procedure, how it goes, sometimes there will be a pressure caused by the stress because unfitness of the process, prosthesis and you are hold your own tissue. So that caused the undue pressure that will cause pain. The last one is a psychological stress. People don't like to have the metal in their body. So when they receive a metal prosthesis inside their body, that sometimes created a kind of a, the, you know, the psychological stress because they have anxiety that developed, even you don't feel you are the same anymore. So that is the concern. So because of these both physical and psychological condition change due to receiving processes, we were thinking about whether there's a better way to help patient to change, uh, to actually be able to uh, repair their cartilage or the way to actually restore the function of their joint. So here comes the way of thinking or the concept has been proposed a couple of years ago. And then people thinking if the cartilage or tissue is damaged inside the joint, can we simply just remove those damaged tissue and regenerate the new tissue? And that tissue is yours. It's a natural biological tissue instead of a plastic or metal prosthesis. So here comes the concept of regeneration. Can we regenerate missing cartilage or damaged cartilage from cells or from resources that we can put it in? So that is the concept of the regenerative medicine for cartilage regeneration. All right. So before I continue to talk about how can we do it, I want to actually introduce you a very interesting study, which is one of the landmark papers published 2006. So the first question is, I want to ask you, maybe do a very short survey. Does cartilage renew or regener regenerate itself? What's the answer? People, if you believe it can regenerate it by itself, please raise your hands. All right, it's about one, two, three, four, five, about 10. Those people who did not raise your hands probably don't believe that cartilage can regenerate it by itself, right? All right, so here comes the very clever study by a Danish, Denmark, the scientists in Denmark. What do they do? They use so-called radio carbon 
dating analysis to determine whether cartilage can regenerate it by itself. Let me give you the conclusion first. Then I will go back to explain how clever their method is to determine whether our body cartilage can regenerate it by itself. So here is the conclusion. The collagen matrix of a human cartilage is an essentially permanent structure with no significant replacement in adult life. And that the occurrence of the disease such as OA osteoarthritis does not increase collagen turnover. Essentially, this sentence tells you cartilage, if no any intervention, they are not going to regenerate it by itself. Why they say that? Here comes the way they do, do it. How many of you have heard carbon-14 bond pose method? Okay, this is very clever. Let me tell you what happened. So you know, between 1950s and 60s, there are a lot of ground testing of the nuclear bomb. So this nuclear bomb released carbon-14 as a radioactive material in the air. So they started about 1950 to 60. So, so the radioactivity actually in the atmosphere reached at the peak in 1965. So this is the actual radioactive detection curve during those years. All right, so because carbon is the essential building block of the DNA. So if the carbon, Carbon-14 is enriched in the air. Human can, or animal can take those in our body through any drinking or just simply breathing. So those carbon-14 can get into our body and then start to incorporate it inside our, our DNA as well as in our tissue and cell. So now we can take DNA or tissue to look at the label of a carbon-14 to determine when is this cell or tissue is established or formed or generated. So that's how they do it. And then how do they do this study? So before I tell you how they do it, so you probably have to take this sentence and to kind of remember it. That will help you to understand the result. So, this is not a hypothesis. This is how they kind of are using this premise to actually conclude their data. So tissue with a high turnover rate, meaning you know they kind of continue to replace it by itself. What has the carbon-14 at the latest and recent atmospheres label, right? So that means you know they can constantly change. It. So tissue with a low turnover, they basically they say build up. 20 years ago. So that carbon 14's label should be the same with the carbon labels in the atmospheres at 40 years, 20 years ago. So that is the kind of the theory behind it. So here comes the way how they do it. So they, in 2012 and 14, these guys, scientists, taking the sample from the patient 15 OA arthritis patient and eight healthy patient take their cartilage sample and then analyze carbon 14 label. These patients were all born around 1950 and 60. So, so they can actually look at their carbon 14 in cartilage. If this cartilage is able to renew itself very quickly. So they should have the carbon-14 label at the much later years, such as they are in the close to the label in 2012 or 2013 or 2020. But if the cartilage was born, when they were born in 1950 or 60, their cartilage label, the uh, uh, carbon-14 label in cartilage should stay similar or at the same label was that those atmosphere carbon 40 label in 1950 and 60. So here is the curve. They found that carbon 14 
in college, specific in college, consistently responded to those in the atmospheres in 1950 and 60. Here is the detection, and this is a curve of the carbon 14 in atmospheres label. So that is very interesting. So essentially, with this data, they conclude collagen is not specifically, this collagen cannot renew itself. So once it's injured, they stay as it is. There's no way they can actually replace it by itself. So that is how the conclusion was made based on the carbon-14 radioactive dating analysis. So I hope I explained it well, and this is a very clever way to actually determine whether our cartilage can be regenerated or not once it's injured. Right. With that, seems like it's, there's no hope, right? No. The hope, I go ahead. Can heal itself from an injury. Is healing different than um, regenerating? Yes, healing and regeneration usually is the term you can exchange that. Okay. But healing can be described as a way of a generated tissue without quality. In other words, let's say you have the scar forming when you have the cut on the skin. What is formed? Fiber tissue. Those are fibro tissue will heal your wound, but it did not generate the same quality of a tissue that is you expected. For example, cartilage can actually be regenerated by, you, by a tissue called fibro cartilage, which is a low quality, not long lasting cartilage. So we don't consider that is regeneration. It's a heal, but it's not regenerated. Okay, all right. Well, I've so, never heard that distinction. What's a this intestine? The healing wasn't a regeneration. Well, it depends on the quality. So regeneration yeah. should generate the same quality or same yeah. type of a structures you had before it's injured. That's a great distinction. Yeah, that's a very big difference. All right, so so what can we do? I have a question. Yes. Um, do you know if collagen in other parts of the body has the same low turnover rate? as collagen and cartilage and joints? There are 22 different, 28 types of collagen, different right? Types. So the different collagens has a different turnover rate. Okay. But in general, we're talking about collagen type two inside of a cartilage. That turnover rate is so long, okay. years. So I remember it's over 20 years, or even 30 years, and much longer, right? How long is that? I don't remember exactly the number, but it generally in your lifetime, those collagen fibers, collagen type two, don't renew itself. That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the cartilage, again, don't regenerate it by itself. When I say that, it's by definition of there is no external intervention. When there's no intervention, meaning no any drug injected or cell injected, it will not regenerate by itself. <clears throat> but scientists or medical doctor developed approaches. Those approaches currently either being used clinic or it's not currently be developed in a laboratory to enhance, to facilitate the cartilage regeneration. Once there's those external interventions is introduced into the joint, cartilage is able to regenerate. So everything I say cartilage is not able to regenerate it. It's by itself without any external force. So here is the external force. You can actually use those approach. And these are approach currently used by orthopedic doctor to encourage cartilage regeneration. So I will not go through all this process a different kind because I want to spend more time to talk about stem cell. But you probably have heard PRP, platelet rich plasma, basically taking your blood, central fugitive, and inject it back. It has a lot of growth factor that can help cartilage regeneration. So in my laboratory, we try, we focus on developing stem cell. Stem cell is the cell type that can help regenerated a lot of the tissues. 
what is the major differences between stem cells and these, the rest of the, you know, the methods I listed here. I use a very quick way to differentiate this and others. Stem cell is like a drug store. It has many kinds of a drug you want, as long as the, the person or your surrounding cell requests the stem cell to do, it can provide all kinds of tools. So it's like a drug store with many kinds of uh, drugs available inside of them. The rest of the stuff is more like, you know, one particular drug can only do one particular job. So that is the major differences. So stem cell being introduced inside the tissue can actually do much more depending on the demand of a surrounding, not just one single particular molecule or particular cytokine, it can do more. So that's why I'm going to focus on. There are three different kinds of a stem cell you probably have heard. Again, UW Medicine is the centers for stem cell research because we were the first group establish embryonic stem cell. That's a history and my friend Jordana can tell you more, but I'm not going to talk about all this. Basically the stem cell from embryo, stem cell from adult tissue can be derived from your fat, your body fat or your own bone marrow. Those are the tissue sources for stem cell. Or you can take those uh, skin cell, turn those uh, skin cell into the stem cell. So there are three different kinds, but I will focus on adult tissue derived stem cell. Why? Because that's the product currently available for you to receive if you have a medical needs, right? Let me tell you what. So these are the 10 different products currently available in the market. So most of them are either derived from fat or derived from bone marrow. And these products are not available in United States. They are all available in East Asia. One of the closest locations you can get these stem cells are from Canada. So Canada has the bone marrow derived stem cell for the purpose, not for the joint. The purpose is for graft versus horse disease, basically prevention of immune response. So that's the only things you can possibly get from Canada to get bone marrow derived stem cells. So these are the ones that are mostly available in other countries. What is available in United States, I will tell you. But before we move on, I want to tell you those stem cell products you have seen on TV or in the magazine, primary are adult tissue derived stem cell. There's no embryonic or induced pure potent stem cell product available. So that's why I'm going to focus on this and hopefully you get enough understanding what you are getting or what you plan to get. So again, these cells can get it from bone marrow, from fat, from umbilical cord blood, or from synovium. Basically, almost every tissue in your body has some sort of stem cells residing inside, waiting for the signal to do the things, primary regeneration. So people like myself can isolate these stem cells and use that stem cell for treatment. That is the stem cells product currently available. And uh, in United States, like what I said, there is no, keep in mind, no any FDA approved stem cell product available for you to get. But there are many clinical trials ongoing that is testing this product for different applications. These stem cells, again, from those adult tissue I just described, can be either from your own body called autologous or from another patient 
which is the allergenic. So they are underdeveloped for different treatments of the diseases. So most of them are in the phase one and phase two clinical trials. This is a very important, you need to know <laughs> what is a phase one and phase two clinical trials. Until you can really, really, before you want to actually get it, just like the, the drugs or medicine you get, any biological product has to pass FDA approval. FDA has the four phases of the approval. That is phase one to phase four to test safety and efficacy of the product. So when I say this product is underdeveloped in phase one and phase two, meaning they are still checking the product's safety and efficacy. Once these two and more efficacy data showing with the more testing subject, you can move on to phase four. That's the last stage they need to check the cost effectiveness for those products being provided to patients. Once this four phases is passed, now you pass the clinical trial. You can start to offer maybe to the general public. There is no FDA approved, like what I say, stem cell product currently available for you to use. So that means there is a concern. When you see those ads, they are the problems there. I want you to be aware of those problems. What's the problem? These guys will tell you two things, which you should pay a lot of attention, be cautious about. Again, stem cells product needs FDA approval because FDA is here to protect your safety. They want to make sure this product is safe, the product is, is pure, cell is pure, and it has the effectiveness for disease treatment. So when you go to a clinic, stem cell clinics, they may tell you, hey, they do have passed those products test. In other words, they may have already submitted so-called investigational new drug, IND application. This is the first stage they can start it, the clinical trial. They will firstly tell you they have this. They may not. Two, they will tell you, hey, stem cell is your own cells. There's no need to get FDA approval. Everything's related to your own cell use in your own body requires no FDA approval, which is a false, not true. So you want to make sure this two are the biggest concern every single time when they try to sell you something or encourage you to do stem cells treatment. So you want to make sure the product is safe because these are the following concern with the injection of a stem cell in your body. When you inject in the stem cells, even if it's your own cell, it could actually cause the side reaction at the, uh, the place you inject in the stem cell to. Or these cells can actually go into another location, which is supposed to stay at the target. For example, you inject the stem cell in your joint cavity. It goes to somewhere else doing some other thing. That's unsafe. And also, they promise these stem cells can do the things they are supposed to do. For example, regenerate the cartilage. But ended up, they go somewhere and maybe cause cancer or cause the issue of the immune response, who knows? Those are the major concerns. Why FDA have to care about your safety and make sure everything is under their regulation and control. So I want to make sure you know the reason why we so care about the um, regulatory stem cells clinics that may cause harm to patients. All right, so, these are the FDA advices that you should seriously consider when you are pursued for doing stem cell treatment. Number one, when someone asks you, hey, we have this great product, you might want to use your own cell to treat your joint diseases. Ask them if they have an IND application number. 
if they jump, that means they haven't get approval by FDA to do research or a clinical trial they are supposed to do. Two, you want to make sure you understand the procedure, what they are trying to do. After they process this cell, how they are going to put it back to your body. Number three, if you are going to somewhere else, for example, those countries with the 10 products that I have previously shown, make sure you know the regulation and safety in that country. So make sure you have been well protected before you decided to receive those products in other countries. So that's what I want to kind of uh, uh, remind you a couple of things that many people, I can tell you, I can I probably receive a phone call every, I would say two or three per week or email asking me whether they are, they, they should receive the, the, the treatments that their doctor or some of their neighbors recommended to do primary stem cell injection. So these are the things I always tell them, make sure they understand what they are doing. So I just want to make sure that you know. All right, so those are the general topics about osteoarthritis, why we need to um, use a stem cell and what stem cells can do and what is the concerns of a stem cells treatment or challenging associated with a stem cell treatment. Here I want to talk to you about my research, what we are currently focused on. I will try to be very, um, I will try to use the plan language, explain it as detailed as possible for you to understand some of these so-called you know, scientific data. But I promise you, you won't fall asleep because I will try to make it uh, as interesting as possible. All right, so one of the very important research goal we try to achieve is that if one day stem cells therapy can be approved and then that can be used for patients, the first important question or the goal I try to achieve is that I want to get good quality of a stem cell for injection. It's understandable. Why? Because when you want to get your own cell injecting to your own body, most of us receive stem cells at the more advanced ages. You probably won't get stem cell treatment when you are age 20 and age 15, right? Most of us will receive stem cells at age 60, 70, 80. So those stem cells has been inside our, our body for 50, 60 years. Depends on how you treat your body. Do you drink a lot? Do you take a lot of medicine? Do you not care about yourself giving enough exercise or those things that keep yourself healthy? Your body age as well as a stem cell age. So think about it. If your body age, you can, even you can, you are allowed to give a stem cell to yourself. Your stem cells is not considered as a young stem cell. They, even they have been isolated and you put it back to your body. They probably have a limited capacity to do the job they are supposed to do compared to someone who is at age 20, receive their own age 20 cells, even younger. That would be differences. In other words, the stem cells capacity is dependent on the donor's age and donor's health condition. You agree with me, right? So my laboratory is trying to see those people who need the help, usually at the advanced stage, how can I make their old stem cell young again? That's the first study I try to present it to you guys. All right, stem cell age. So the number of stem cells decrease along with the age. That's very obvious. So why these guys are aged? Number one, because a lot of stress. So those are stress, such as oxidative stress, protein ag uh, aggregation, inflammation, all those stress come with age that stress your stem cell. So stem cell aged. 
and then the repair system inside of our cell get decreased. In other words, they cannot really do what they were supposed to do when they were young, right? So this DNA repair, metabolic biogenesis, those are the repair system become less and less active. So because of the balance of degeneration and increase of stress, that caused the stem cell aging. So this is the problem. So like what I say, when you are young, you take your young cell and you can actually implant your young cell. But when you are getting older, those are old cells and tends to have a capacity decrease. So they cannot really do anything. But these are the one we try to help. So how can we do the help? Can we not produce new stem cells throughout our life? Yes, true. Most of the stem cells is inside of our body. Depends on the, what kind of stem cell. For example, hematopoietic stem cell. Those are hematopoietic stem, stem cells basically can renew itself, but they are continually under stress because of the aging inflammation in our body. It's not just the number, it's the environment caused the stress. So they cannot, even as soon as they generate it, they are not able to actually provide kind of an energy level as they were when they were young because they are less inflammation, less stress on them. Yes, okay. Are stem cells only in one part of our body or are they all the way through? Adult stem cells in the tissue, they are almost everywhere. Okay, so is there a difference with some of the things that you mentioned in the previous slide about like inflammation and stress in there? Could it be at different levels in different parts of your body? Yes, yes, that definitely is true. Because you, for example, Alzheimer's diseases, that right. attacks the whole entire you know, neuron system. So a lot of neurogenic uh, neuron stem cells are probably are under stress more than others' tissue. But for example, pancreas, right? So if it is a pancreas, someone who has a diabetes, those are pancreas cells, stem cells that stay in the pancreas, probably also being affected as well. So it depends on the situation and then inflammation is not the same at the different uh, in the, at the same level in the different tissue. So do you look for like the best part to take them from? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very good question. When you say that, you probably means that, you know, we can take it from fat or to the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did not do those kind of a study, but the people has reported the data. There are differences in terms of stress label in these different tissue ended up the cell taken from this different tissue may have a different, upper, a different capacity. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> but my point here is, I don't care where they are coming from. In general, no matter how careful you are, your body is aging and your cell is aging, right? So how can I help to make them young again? For example, I have a 60 years old stem cell. Can I make them become like a 20 years old, I mean, 10 years old stem cell? This can be done. Let me tell you how it's done. So imagine you have these uh, aged stem cells inside your body. So we now can actually tell them, hey, we know how you get aged, how you are actually become not able to do the things. We can put you back to more primitive stage. And that primitive stage is called cellular reprogramming. You take this cell, remember, in the development, we are all coming from the same cell, one single cell, fertilized egg, right? So that fertilized egg, we actually differentiated, specialized into different cell types that becoming your bone, your cartilage, your brain, your skin cell. That's called differentiation. So this process, we call it differentiation. Now we can actually going back to take this differentiated cell and put them back to their primitive stage, closer to their embryonic stage. That's called induced pure potent stem cell. How do we do that? Scientists already find those markers, particularly some sort of the driver inside of the cell 
can, if you make them produce more, these so-called pluripotent marker can make the cell become young again. That's called induced pluripotent stem cell. So if you can just remember, bear with me, it's called cellular reprogramming. So reprogram from the old cell to the young cell called cellular reprogram. So this process is magic. I can take your skin cell, make it into induced pluripotent stem cell, similar to embryonic stem cell at early stage of your life. That is called cellular reprogram. You say, how guys, how can you scientists do that? This is not magic. This is actually happening every single day. Imagine, just like what I said, iPSC induced pluripotent stem cell is like an embryonic stem cell. If they do have that capacity, you can imagine going back to see how the newborn is able to reset their biological clock. 30, 40 years old parents provide their own cell, which is an egg and sperm. Those cells carry the gene at 30, 40 years old at the same age of the parents, right? So that you agree. But these two, when they fertilize, what happened? There is a process called fertilization. That process reset biological clock, make this newborn baby to start it from biological clock at zero, right? So this is the source of our embryonic stem cell. These are the cells with the capacity and genetics make up similar to induced pluripotent stem cell, which I just described using cellular reprogramming to reprogram those old cell or you can say somatic cell, differentiate cell back to induced pluripotent stem cell. Those cells is similar to embryonic stem cell. So I just want to quickly tell you, this is not magic. This is the kind of, you know, we doing things what the nature does, but we just figure out how to do it in the lab. So with that concept, you won't feel, ah, these guys are crazy. How do they do that? We're just kind of doing what the nature does, but we figure out how to do it, right? So if you can think about it, this is what we do. Very interesting research in my laboratory. Thank my postdoc in my laboratory, Dr. Zhao, who has taken synovium fluid, joint fluid, derived a stem cell. There's a kind of, you know, stem cells floating there, or you can say progenitor cells, stem in there. We reprogram the cell back to induced pluripotent stem cell. Basically, erase those aging markers. They are gone, they become young again. Then we differentiate these cells, make them become the same cell type as their parental cell. Now we have this same cell from the same patient, but these cell just younger than their parental cell. So we can do that. Once we have these cell, IPS, MSC, we can start it injecting or making cartilage tissue as we want. And what's the difference between these two? Again, this guy a much younger has been rejuvenated artificially by using cellular reprogram. That's a simple way I put it together. So we now can make the old cell become young stem cell, then further differentiate it into this young target cell. And this cell too are the same cell, only age differences. That's, that's what I want to say. So we want to actually compare this young and old cell. Let me give you at least two slides scientific data to show you it truly become younger again. I promise it will not be too much, okay? So number one, the way we check whether they are young or not, it's by the number. So if you look at the, this is non-reprogram, old cell, this is a young cell. So you can see those little tiny uh, spindle shape of cell, they are more compared to the younger one, given the same amount of time to grow. And then this is a curve after 18 days. These guys are younger cell. They can generate more 
proliferated more, repopulated themselves more faster. That's the one side of the younger cell, right? So it's very obvious, right? If you're younger, you can regenerate it much faster. Can you review what MF, MSC, oh. just what those definitions are? Oh. Synovian fluid, Synovian fluid, the joint fluid. derive mesenchymal stem cells. Yeah. Okay, not muscle stem cells. Yeah, not muscle stem cells. It's a mesenchymal, it's a from bone marrow. Okay. All right, so, so you can say it's kind of like a, the, this is synovian fluid, but it's a mesenchyme. Mesenchyme is the developmental terminology. It, it means, you know, it comes from the mesoderm. The mesoderm is the area of an embryo that generated muscle, bone, and cartilage. All right, so, so number one, that's two. And two, just look at the staining. This is actually the marker of an aging, similar to the gray hair or wrinkle of your head or your face or your head. So if you see the green color here, that means they are older. They have this marker indicating I'm older. So you can see the reprogram cell has less marker, aging marker, compared to their parental cell. Once you reprogram it, they just become younger again. So I guess I can probably skip this. And then without saying this, this is just another marker demonstrated uh, it's young again. So is this the messenger RNA level? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. This is actually the protein. Oh, protein. This is a protein, and this is a, a messenger RNA. Okay. Yeah. So this is a protein. So these are the aging marker. The aging marker shows you have a more aging marker here. And this guy is the proliferative marker, meaning they are more proliferative if they have this marker. So basically just, just uh, um, I realized I want to actually spend more time to talk about the data. So what is beauty of the next step? Once we have this two, we are able to identify what gene what molecule control aging? We found it. We found GABA6 and FOXP1 are two very important molecules that control aging, at least partially. There is no magic one single molecule control everything. But what we found here is the key molecule regulate stem cell aging. So essentially, GABA6 is pro aging marker. FOXP1 is anti-aging marker. They actually work counteractive together inside of our cell. So this data just show when we take out that particular pro-aging marker, that aging marker is gone. Wrinkle is gone. Gray hair is gone for the cell. The anti-aging marker, once we take it down, that means there's no break for aging, right? So they become aged. So there are more gray hair, more wrinkles. So that is the data shows here. So just kind of telling you, we identify this particular gene molecule. Why this is important? Here is the case. We may be able to develop the drug specifically target to regulate those two genes activity. Imagine if we know the target, we can regulate that guy pro aging marker, make them young, uh, decrease the anti aging marker, make them increase as what we did artificially controlling the gene. Can we do that using the drug? That's the one beauty. Two, if we know how this stem cell aged, we may be able to understand why we have the musculoskeletal related diseases which is aging related, such as osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. Osteoporosis is the stem cell not able to become bone, one of the reasons. So can we actually understand why these genes are being regulated differently, making the bone generation less effective in aging population? So that's a, the second reason why it's important. Three, we may be able to really actually make our young, you come to the clinics, fine, you are 18 years old. Can we take your 80 years old cell somehow using the way we actually identify, manipulate it, 
rejuvenate it and then put it back. Even you are 80, you can enjoy having the 20 years old, 15 years old stem cells to help you to pre treat your disease. So that's something we found it potentially significant about our research finding. All right, so with the time, I want to spend a couple of time, a couple of slides and tell you the next kind of uh, interesting study we have done. Now we have a stem cell. We want to actually start to regenerate the cartilage. Remember, your cartilage is degenerating or it's gone because of the osteoarthritis, right? So can we regenerate these cartilage inside of the animal as a proof of a concept? One day we can use that data and doing the same in you. So first thing is we use a small animal. Small animal is cheaper, less regulatory requirement. So we can actually use a mouse to check whether the stem cell can regenerate the cartilage or generate cartilage inside. So the answer is yes. This white piece, transparent tissue, is cartilage-like tissue inside of the mice that we regenerate. So these are histology picture. If you look at the real cartilage histology section, you can see this little tiny white spot is the cartilage cell. So we can simulate or replicate the morphology or the structure of a cartilage using stem cell. That's something I want to show you. And this different color indicated the extracellular matrix of a cartilage protein glycan, those are the matrix of a your cartilage. So it is abundant of those cartilage matrix. Suggesting we successfully making collagen type two, again, green color indicate the production of a cartilage specific matrix, which is a cartilage type two. Answered in your question, that's collagen type two. Without collagen type one, or collagen type 10. Why cartilage type one is important to check? Because those low quality of a cartilage called fibro cartilage, which is essentially fibrous tissue, which is not good quality or uh, considered as a long lasting cartilage, produce collagen type one. They don't. Just a little bit, but it's not big enough to actually affect the quality of the cartilage. So this slide basically tells you we successfully making cartilage inside of the little tiny mouse. That's not good because a mouse is different from human. So the next step before we can actually see uh, getting approval for clinical human clinical trial, we need to go making our animal model bigger from mouse to the larger animal, all right? So we're thinking about larger animal. What kind of a large animal we can, we can use? There are several factors that is important to be considered. Number one, you want to consider joint size, right? The size of a joint will be nice to be similar with the human joint. And these are the animal, two animal, rabbit and rat, maybe too small. And uh, the she, host and pig, human are probably uh, similar with their joint size. The second very important factor is the thickness of a cartilage. You know, every animal has a different thickness of the, the cartilage. So like the pig and horse has similar cartilage thickness with the humans. Those are perfect models. However, horse are too expensive. You probably cannot really, really use a horse to do 20 animal study. And also horse is too big, not many vet will be able to handle it and then be able to operate it. So that is required a significant effort to collaborate it with someone who has that capacity to do horse. So now it turns out to be pig, maybe a reasonable and also a very nice model we can use. So here comes our next study. We're thinking about, hey, not domestic pig, because domestic pig, again, 400 pounds, that normally no one can handle it. But this little tiny mini pigs, 
can possibly do the job. So we were thinking what the type of the mini pig we can possibly use to check availability and popularity of these animal strengths, or you can say pig breeds. We have identified Yucatan, Dantigen, Wisconsin mini. Those are the three pigs model we can use. But we need to find out which one actually being able to do the better job in terms of making the reprogram stem cell. Here is a very interesting first time study we have done. I don't know if uh, we first have to decide it, how we are going to make these cells. So we take the cell, which is actually pig skin cell. We convert it or reprogram these cells into the stem cell. So now we have this pig induced pluripotent stem cell for regeneration of a cartilage. That's the first step. We have to do it. Once we have this induced pluripotent stem cell from skin, from pig, we now can actually make in a cartilage outside the body, then implant it back to that particular animal. So that's called autologous transplantation of the stem cell or cartilage. Interestingly, this is the first finding. No one has done that before. Our group is the first time doing this. We actually found there's differences between different spe same species, but the reprogramming efficiency is different between different breeds of the pig. Very interesting, pick a pig, but because of their different breeds, <laughs> they have a different reprogramming efficiency. In other words, the number of the stem cell we can generate are different between all these different pigs. Even they are same mini pig, same species, but different species, different breeds. <clears throat> we are the first one identify this kind of interesting data. Another group also have identified interesting differences between African-American, Caucasian, in terms of their cell reprogramming efficiency. The result has been published in stem cell. African-Americans descendants, their cells tends to be easier to be reprogrammed than Caucasian cell. Same cell, but different, same species, human race, but different colors of people. They have differences in terms of their cellular reprogramming efficiency. My lab has identified the story between behind these differences. We have just submitted a paper, now it is under review. We have found some epigenetic protein, which is actually enzyme, is behind the differences of these reprogramming efficiency. I'm not going to talk about that too much because, you know, again, limit the other time. Now we have this cell from the pig, we can actually put it back. How do we put it back? We make it into a cartilage piece of tissue and then implant it back to the previously created defect. Of course, this pig doesn't have the osteoarthritis, right? So we have to make a traumatic defect. We have to kind of whack it. There's nothing we can do. This is the best way. Whack and make a defect. Then implant it, the cartilage that is generated from our cell in order to evaluate its stem cell activity. All right, so first thing, after one month, we check the cells that we implanted, or you can say tissue implanted. You can see this white spot are cartilage. Control, which means we whack their cartilage, created the defect. You can see that, right? The defect is still there with MRI data. But the cartilage we implanted somehow fill the little tiny hole. Even it's not perfect, but you can see the defect is repaired. So that's a very good sign after one month. We sacrifice the animal after four months. And then we check these guys before we sacrifice them. They have the defect on the joint. Now they are supposed to have some sort of a difficulty in walking, right? But you can see how they walk.
they walk perfectly well. There's no pain, they don't feel pain. If they feel pain, they will stay there idle and not walking. Is that at Arlington or uh, campus? Uh, it's on campus on the um, was the mineral, um, uh, mineral point. Uh, uh, Charmony. Charmony, yes. Yeah. So I have a 24 pigs there. They are great. They, they take care of my... Um, but I, I have to apologize. If anybody who is animal right people, I just have to tell you this is this is what we can do best because for the humankind, the the best of the humankind, the human beings' uh, welfare, we really have to do this kind of animal study. But we try to limit it, the number of the animal as much as we can, and we get we we take a good care of them. All right, so they are happy, and and and, and uh, it happens. I live in the um, uh, very close by in the University Hill Farm community. My daughter, who is nine years old, knows I'm doing this kind of a study, um, really have a problem with me. Are you going to kill all the little tiny cute pigs? <laughs> uh, I, feel, I have to explain it to her. Yeah, I, I have a good friend who works at Charmin mm -hmm. and has for years caring for the animals. So you can tell your daughter that while their lives may be shorter, they're very well cared for and, yes. and, and treated quite well. Well, when they walk out, they do a good job of giving them marshmallows. So they are happy to actually chasing the, their marshmallows in that little pen. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so here is the histology picture. Again, this is actually the gold standard control. You see, the red color is the cartilage. There's no repair. Once we created that defect, no repair. And this is an acellular, meaning there's no cell. We just put the matrix there. Also, no repair. When we use the so called bone marrow stem cell or stromal cell, there's a repair, but not too much, right? So it has some hope, but it's again, it's still short from being good. Once we have our induced pure potent stem cell, you can see the repair started. Even if it is not perfect, you can still see a little space here that needs to be filled. The reason is we only keep them for four months. Giving them longer time, they will be able to do better. But animal study is very expensive. We cannot possibly keep these guys for two years. Thinking about degeneration takes years to develop. To regenerate it, we don't expect in the same amount of time, but at least half of the time. So I think four months is too short. We need to give them longer time. But this at least shows a very promising result that one day we may be able to use the stem cell to regenerate cartilage defect. And here, the, the green color, again, collagen type two, more of this color indicated regeneration of the articular good quality of cartilage, which is native cartilage to our joint. So there are a lot of them generated from this induced pluripotent stem cell group, which is our target treated group, compared to the control group or even the gold standard bone marrow derived stem cells. So this process, again, IPSC, make the cell younger, <laughs> definitely gives advantage to those cells which has not been reprogrammed before. So, so again, this shows the concept of getting our cells reprogrammed, put it back and repair cartilage. All right, so that is last piece of the scientific data I want to demonstrate it. This is the first proof of the concept of study that shows that we can take our skin cell, reprogram it into the stem cell, and then make it into <coughs> cartilage and put this cartilage generated from your own cell back to your body and repair cartilage defect. So, so, so basically this will create the possibility one day we can use this model to actually provide a hope for patients who may not be willing to use metal or plastic prosthesis to repair their cartilage. We can start it thinking about your own biological approach to regenerate cartilage by itself with intervention using stem cell approach. All right. So this is the last piece. I want to thank all these people. We have the lab manager and my 
scientist as well as a graduate student. Uh, Brian Wozak is uh, was my graduate student, but he is a medical doctor. He is an orthopedic doctor. Now he is running his own lab next to my laboratory. Um, and also we have another doctor now is in the clinical uh, department. So also in the uh, rehabilitation departments and doing his own research. Um, specifically, I want to thank NIH for providing most of this funding for this project. Again, the PIC study is $2.5 million uh, project. Uh, we generated a lot of papers and uh, what you see is probably just one tenth of the data. I don't have uh, enough time to share with share you all this. This study cannot be possibly be done without national funding, funding such as NIH federal government support. So stem cell research is very expensive. Animal research is even more costly. So uh, I appreciate the funding sources. And uh, particularly, I want to thank the, this uh, foundation. And also there is a family foundation based in uh, Milwaukee and uh, Plunkett Family Foundation, who is also friends of uh, Jordana. Um, she introduced that uh, foundation head, uh, friends of hers to me. And then uh, we have a, a great um, interaction and uh, the family foundation decided to fund my research and then uh, provides the, their generous support, general, generous gift to help my research. And I really appreciate this foundation providing. So that three picks reprogramming efficiency work was supported specifically by Plunkett Family Foundation. Thank you very much for your attention. And Uh, of course, <laughs> anything associated with degeneration of a cartilage or defect cartilage can be benefited from our research. Particularly, stem cell has a capacity, which I did not show it here. They are able to immunomodulate the environment. In other words, they have a capacity to suppress inflammation. If rheumatoid arthritis caused cartilage degeneration is due to increase of the inflammation or immune cells, injecting stem cells in that region is able to suppress these inflammation caused by the overreactive immune cell. So definitely that will be possible. Yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, it, it, there's a, a, a big cost in uh, you know, reprogramming the cells and making younger for the autologous donation. I was wondering how that cost might compare to just having a bunch of like allergenic lines out there already. So you, you just have to just put those in and maybe deal with rejection issues. How, how would that balance out? The, the cost of uh, you know, doing it on an individual basis versus just dealing with rejection. Okay, cool. That's very good questions. Uh, very nice question. So the pig study I didn't mention is the first study checking the concept of autologous. In other words, every single pig cells that you see is from two years ago, we isolated from the same pig. So that is the reason this study is so costly and so expensive, so difficult to do. No one has done this. So most of people don't think this is a practical way to get stem cell treatment works. So people are working on allergenic, meaning the different donors share their stem cell. This proves to be practical because stem cell seems to be very primitive. They are not yet to be able to be recognized by immune cell. There are many studies have shown taking human cell inject into animal or taking pig cell inject into rabbit, different species stem cell did not cause immune response. So we are currently, and many other scientists try to find out why this stem cell has a capacity to do immune regulation. Not clear yet, but it seems to be okay. No immune response was generated from 
patient receiving the different patients of stem cell. So that I can answer you. So it's very likely one day there will be an off shelf stem cell product that can possibly be used by the patient who did not provide their own stem cell, but can benefit from other super stem cell. Umbilical blood is a good source for stem cells. Could that potentially be used to produce enough stem cells for right? Yeah, so the umbilical cord blood is a younger cell. So suppose they, they have the capacity probably with the advantage, but without the disadvantage of the old cells. So that has been investigated. Um, so I will say, yes, it will be a potential source of the stem cell product. However, currently there are a lot of a commercial company, they try to sell you the program, say you should save your own or your daughter's own uh, daughters, whenever given the birth that you should save their uh, stem cell for future use. I will be very cautious about this. Number one, the safety of the cell is critical. If you are thinking about taking the stem cell and store it, and then you want to use it, that's probably 40 years later. How can you make sure the 40 years of a period of time, they continue to charge you for the service fee? In those 40 days, there will be no single days or single minutes that these cells are under attention. In other words, someone forgets you actually keep them cool enough and they change the property and then you don't know, they don't tell you. How do you make sure the 40 years long quality control? That's one. Two, at that time, 40 yeah. years later, I can tell you those issues associated with the young and old, which is the reason we choose the umbilical cobra, probably no longer to be an issue. Based on my understanding, we can now reprogram your own cell, make it into young again. So why not just use your own cell? Even possibly like the, this gentleman says, we can probably just take in the off-shelf products which is not necessarily from the umbilical cord blood. It can be from maybe induced pluripotent stem cells, but those cells are even more powerful and more capable than the umbilical cord blood. So I will be very concerned. I'm not going to, if I were, why would you, someone ask me, hey, can you pay the service fee for 40 years for, to save your uh, stem cell? I won't do that because there's no company you know, even GE or even Microsoft, can any company can last long, that long? Not sure. <laughs> if someone okay. just broke. Yeah. You can, like instead of saving your child all in cell support, you can also free still, I think, donate the cord blood to a research bank for researchers to study together, right? Right. And the cord blood registry or something like that. But I haven't checked it for many years, so I don't know if it's still a good option for people who just want to contribute to research overall. If the stem cells don't include the new response, could you take any newborn umbilical stem cells and use those in anyone? They don't have to be stored for 40 years. You could take any newborn cells and use them as a source of stem cells that could be programmed to do what yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that, that is definitely do possible. But again, you know, the FDA is not mm -hmm. able to really root out what's the problems later on if we take in the cells and not from the off. Right. So so we're still trying to figure out whether this immune modulation or uh, other concerns that we may possibly have, it truly not there, mm -hmm. you know, if we use a different cell type, right? Yeah. Definitely is possible, but again, you know, this is still under exploratory stage. Thank you. I'm not sure yet. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.